we can proceed with our workshop at 7 o'clock. Look at I that. Know, Look at that. Testing, work. testing. So, All right, good. Listen to that. Start singing, Tim. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it makes me wonder if they've ever worked. Uh, yeah, I was say, it's never been on. Now that you can all hear, there are no excuses. I think you're right. No. It's <laughs> never been on. <laughs> no whispering it's been a anymore. Problem. Yeah, no more whispering. All right. So the first. Now Matt oh. isn't mumbling. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we don't really call the roll, do we? No. No. All right. We're all here. Thank you, everyone, for being here. This was thrown into the schedule. So. Uh, Thank you for being flexible. We have so many items to cover in workshops. So first item, small business outreach. And we begin with an opportunity for a public comment. I, before we do that, I will read the, uh, the motion that brought this here. It was uh, from September 11 town council meeting of 2023, which the council uh, which was referred to the workshop, a review of town policies, organizational structures, and ordinances relating to attracting and retaining non-residential small businesses with the goal of identifying specific steps that can be taken by the town council and town boards and staff. So anyway, uh, we'll begin with public comment. I don't see anyone in the chamber. Is there anyone online? Who would like to comment? No hands raised at the moment. No hands raised. Okay. <clears throat> we will begin. Uh, I know, uh, Councilor Anderson, would you like to uh, make a comment? Um, Kick us off. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, at, uh, we also agreed, um, this is also on our goals. And I had indicated at one of our prior workshops that I would be happy to take the lead on this. And uh, Councillor Jordan said that she would like to assist. And also um, uh, Councillor Gillis. So uh, I guess we can get started on it now. All right, are there further comments? I just want to do a Jordan. little bit of um, kind of clarification, only because when I see non-residential uh, small businesses, so um, I don't know if this is considered a small business, but it's a uh, lobster outlet on Fowler Road, which I think is in a residential zone. So is it businesses such as that as well? And I think we can, as a committee, maybe talk about that. Um, and when we say policies, I guess we can iron out what, what policy might be, and I know that uh, Cape Farm Alliance is working on some policy. Um, and how do we define organizational structure? What do we mean by that? Or is that something we want our group to figure out? I was kind of wondering what that meant too, and. I guess we can try to figure it out. And then come back to the group with, here's how, here's the type of businesses that we feel that we're gonna be focusing on and what we wanna do, so come back with a plan. Yeah. I mean, shouldn't we be speaking to some of these small business people right now and, and finding out what their issues are so that we can bring that information to you? To the, I mean. The way, okay, the way I envision this yeah. is, the three of us would have a meeting okay. and talk about how to go about this. Okay. I've already received a list of all the businesses in town, mm -hmm. and I was thinking maybe sending them a letter along with a couple of questions about you know what challenges, we wanna to talk to you about what challenges you had, what, what improvements you think could be made, whether there are processes that could be improved upon, and then have some sort of summit and I don't know if it would be with all the businesses or sort of divide them up, like by category. I don't know. I haven't thought that far, but that's, that's sort of what I'm thinking might be the process going forward now that we're getting the official green light. 
So the first step is when are we going to meet? Yeah. Yes, I would think. Do you agree, Penny? Yeah, I think that we get together and talk about it and then figure out what the process would be and, and just come back to the group and say, here's what we're going to do. If you have any problems, then feel free to come to one of our meetings. <laughs> so. Okay. Councillor Gabrielson. Um, I think it's great that you guys want to take some initiative on this and, and have some discussions and report back. I'm, I'm just curious from a, like a public process perspective, um, and maybe Deborah can help us with this, it, do, do we need to formally create a subcommittee or is it enough to just sort of notice that as a special workshop of a subset of the council? And I'm just curious on that. Yeah, I think if the council is in agreement, you all agree, don't have any objections. And like you said, it would have to be a notice meeting, you know, with agenda minutes and so forth. So I would be happy to help you folks through that. So, yeah, great. I think, I think this is an exciting uh, step. And I, I think we should take advantage of the Cape Courier. And I'd really like to see a story in the Courier about the work that you're getting ready to take off on and encourage them to get some feedback to you, uh, let them know what you're doing. Uh, be a great way to communicate uh, this nice step that the town uh, is doing to, to make uh, our town more business friendly. So Courier would be a great tool. Now, are you all within this contemplating the idea of some type of economic development staff or focus, or is that, are we too small a town for that? Or uh, I know this has come up, so I don't know. That might fall under organizational structure. Okay. That's. When I threw out the question, I assumed that might be what the answer was. I was pointing at you. Oh. <laughs> yes, and I know there's been uh, talk of the planner, you know, whether the planner could do some of this. But I think she has said that, uh, I believe, at some point that maybe that would be a conflict with her role, so maybe she couldn't assume that hat as well. I don't, but. But no, don't, don't, don't you think the group would analyze whether that's a needed um, role? Yeah. And it may be found that it is redundant and we just need to clarify the planner's role. That would be my thought. But. You know, I just, my observation is, I think like all of you with, with the COVID situation, with, uh, you know, so many cities, including Portland, having downtown office space now being vacant. You know, law firms permanently, people working out of the homes. It would seem to create more incentive for small business in a place like Cape, you know, I mean, a viable business, and so therefore it does warrant. That's another reason to have this discussion and have maybe to consider some type of a staff expertise or focus. That could assist the planner. Speaking of small business, now do you all have inside track on a bakery? I see fresh bread or banana bread or something. Alivesbrook Farm. <laughs> all right. Because <laughs> we all want a bakery, so. Okay. Just, Mr. Chairman, if, yes. if I may, just one, one other item for the group to also consider is back in January, if you recall, uh, the, the council passed the uh, small business amendments uh, for home, uh, small uh, yes, zoning ordinance right. referring for a home business. Amendments. So that's, uh, and we've got our first building permit relating to that. And it was the gentleman in, uh, in the Broad Cove neighborhood uh, who was looking to do that. So we've received the building permit for that. So you've already seen some, uh, some changes for that, but then also publicizing that as an, uh, as an option or a viable option where folks, it, it, consistent with the chairman's comments a few moments ago of you know, commercial space in the city uh, proper being vacated for folks working from home, so that might open some opportunities to think as, you know, either professionals, attorneys, or other, other forms of professions who may want to expand their home office occupation into something of a little larger scale. So there is some, there is some uh, capacity there that could be developed for sure. So that's, that may be something to consider in those conversations. A low impact in 
neighborhood. Yep, yep, exactly. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Otherwise, you come back to have that conversation again in the, Remember, in the future. Remember, a farm so. can be anywhere. Yeah, Very yeah, good. Sure can. Are there any further comments from any councillors? All right. We can go to item two. Request from Councillor Anderson to forward ADU amendments to the planning board. And um, Councillor Anderson uh, working with Ben McDougall, Ordinance Committee, Town Planner, bringing this forward. Thank you, Councillor Anderson, who's, who along with Councillor Thompson served on the Housing Diversity Committee. We'll be hearing about that report in our next item. So this all seems to me to be related. And at any rate, we begin again with an opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone online who would like to comment on this item? <coughs> No hands raised at the moment, Mr. Chairman. All right. Seeing no one online, no one in the chamber, we can begin the discussion. And I will turn it to Councillor Anderson. Thank you. Um, yes, the we're we're going to be talking about the Housing Diversity Study Committee tonight, the report, and one of the recommendations. There is a section on ADUs, which I imagine we'll talk about. However, these specific suggestions ge were generated from a meeting that I had with Ben and with Maureen about the grant that we were maybe going to apply for. Um, we, were, we were looking at setting up or standing up an ADU toolkit and it was determined that you know we couldn't do the, um, the multiple architectural plans that I was hoping we would be able to do. So, what we talked about doing instead was um, setting up a, a page on the website, on our town website, that would have frequently asked questions. It would have sort of a process uh, explanation. It would have the, the uh, relevant uh, ordinances. There would be a link um, to, um, to architectural companies that actually do this kind of thing. And I know that um, Backyard ADUs, for example, builds a lot of ADUs and they have, they have their own in-house designs and plans that somebody can pick, as does Knickerbocker. And there are probably other firms that we're not aware of. So put that information up there as well. And Ben pointed out these two issues that I thought in order to get rolling on encouraging ADUs and making them easier, a couple of these changes really needed to go into effect right away. And um, there is an anomaly where if you have a standalone building um, and you want to turn that into an ADU, you can't. You got to tear it down and then build new and that's, doesn't make sense. it doesn't make sense. It's rather absurd. So um, this is designed to deal with that. And that would be the accessory structures yes. and so forth. And I, I would just quickly ask uh, Councillors Jordan and Harriman, who worked on this extensively in the past Ordinance Committee, if you uh, have any concerns about this, or if you, are you in agreement with these changes recommended by... <laughs> I assume you are, but I don't want to... I don't know. No, I, I mean, we worked extensively on the ADU amendments, but those aren't the ones that were passed. So, yes, I do believe that these changes need to be made. I will uh, ask, um, and please don't take this as a, a, a criticism. I just, it's an observation because I, I read uh, Ben McDougall's memo and I, and I looked at the definition changes and I just want to ask if there are other elements within the LD2003 amendments that we also need to tweak at this point in time or is this the only one? Um, I, there may be other elements that need to be 
that might have been missed or overlooked? Just to, but because I, I, and I say that because as I read this, I, I go, we had covered this base, but the, the uh, amendments that were voted on and implemented didn't uh, address the same definition. So only so that we help uh, code enforcement if we want to have a, a quick run through of the ordinance committee kind of just assessing other, other places that we need to tweak in order to make sure that we don't have any, any gaps. That's my only question. I'm not opposed to this definition. Councillor Gillis. Can I ask you a question, Penny? Yes. Speak into your, Susan. Are you asking about more things on the, on the ADU thing that needs to be que tweaked? No, the overall oh, the overall. that okay. were all right. all implemented. Right. Okay. I right. just want to make sure that... Okay. No, I, I, I just want to make sure... run that. through it and just say, uh, okay. are there any anomalies here? I mean, the, the whole fact that there was an assumption about teardowns, that was interesting. Um, but are there other little gaps that maybe we would want to send along to the planning board at the same time. So I, it looks like um, Mr. McDougall did a review and came up with these three. But so I, in all fairness, that we were focused only on ADUs, not the entire structure. I'm not aware of anything else. I mean, perhaps if there is something else that needs to be fixed, our town attorney can let us know or our town planner can let us know. Okay. You mean, yes. like review, or oh. like have them review it now or just if something pops up, then to let us know? What's your intention with that statement? As far as I'm concerned, they, it could be reviewed now. Well, that's what Penny is asking is basically for it to get sent to ordinance so that we can review it and have the proper people review it, like the planner and the attorney and the ordinance committee. Oh, I have no objection to that, but I would like to take these ADUs amendments and send them directly to wherever they need to go. Okay. Because I think these are Gaps. Well, I'm, they're, they're little tweaks. I mean, they're, I think they need to be done. Now, the issue about whether or not, I mean, maybe there's a policy issue about whether or not they can be used as long, short-term rentals. We had already, yeah. Yes. So we're gonna send these ordinance changes to planning board without it going through ordinance committee first. Is that your request? One question. Second question is, doesn't this have to be voted on and sent to the planning board or can we just workshop it, nod our head and send it to the planning board? I, if I may, sure. our town planner informed me that it could go directly to the planning board. And I, that would be my preference because I mean, I, I want, I'd like this to be a bit fast track while being transparent, but I, that, that was her suggestion. That was Maureen's suggestion that it would go directly to planning. Well, I, so I would think, <clears throat> I don't think the procedure it, would. I don't Procedurally, think. I do not believe that it can just go. Like there's been not voted on by anyone to be reviewed and we can't vote on it tonight because we're in okay. workshop. So literally the ordinance committee hasn't voted on it. Town council hasn't voted on it. So we're basically taking words that I'm assuming Stephanie wrote and we're just gonna send them on without being voted on. Um, I didn't write them, well, then I, no. but actually, you know, this was, I asked that this be placed on our agenda for Monday. And so I, I don't want, I, I don't want to suggest that Maureen didn't get it right. Well, Maureen doesn't do the agenda, Tim. Well, she, she told me that it could go from the town council directly to the planning board. Correct, if we had voted on it on Monday night. So we would put on the agenda for April right. to vote on. Right. Because it could be the case, and especially with the uh, prohibiting short-term rentals, not everyone's in agreement with that policy, but if 
we can vote on it April to, to go to the, the planning, planning board. board so. But in the meantime, we have an ordinance committee meeting scheduled before that that could review it and take a quick look over anything else. So then we're not wasting more time if we wanted to do that. Yes, Mary Bell. Uh, thank you, uh, through the chair. Um, if this would be of help at all, I think all your dates line up pretty well, uh, to be honest, functionally, because we're on what what's today, the 13th of March. So um, the way the, the dominoes kind of line up, for lack of a better way to put it, April 8th, council has your council meeting. In between now and then, ordinance committee can also uh, review that to make sure that's where they like to be. April 8th, you can put that on the council uh, agenda for referral to the planning board. It's not a big building. I can talk to the, uh, our town planner and say, preemptively put this on the April 16th planning board agenda for a public hearing, and you can refer it on the 8th. And the quick, I mean, they're not meeting again until uh, until April, April, um, I think, 9th. They'll have their, either the second, I think either the second or the 9th, they'll have their workshop they don't need to worry about that, so they can have it on the 16th. They can hold the public hearing on that back on the council agenda in May, and then you can act, you know, you can uh, then at that point hold a pu schedule a public hearing for that as well, and then get that into place. Yeah. But that, that gives us, to be frank, it also gives us the opportunity to, to make sure we uh, adequately advertise as well and meet the, uh, the re statutory requirements when it comes to that. So I think that, I, th I think we can meet uh, Councilor Anderson's desire for expediency, but also meet the uh, council's overall desire for uh, uh, for staying uh, inside the lines on the coloring in the coloring book, so to speak. So I think we can accomplish all those goals with that with that track. If that if that's if that works with along lines with where you'd like. Thank. And if I may, while well, on roll, Mr. Sure. Chair, uh, the ADU part is the first thing you know because this was approved in December. And you had that 30-day period of when you know before it became effective into law as an ordinance change. Uh, the first item that came up, came up that we did run into because uh, there is some pent-up demand for accessory structures to be converted into that, and this was an unintended ca uh, casualty from uh, from the changes. So that's the first item that came up because there was anticipated uh, uh, demand in the within town to make those conversions. So that's why this really became uh, front and center. Quickly, there, you know, as as we go through and and, and you know we walk forward and, and changes do come into play, uh, we will we we will or may find with any ordinance change uh, that there are areas that we need to maybe look at technical amendments. So uh, there may be a couple as over time over the next couple of months as you know as the world advances that we may find that there are other technical sides of it that we could come back with a larger uh, recommendation to the council and for the ordinance committee to. To move forward with as a, as a larger package of technical amendments, if, if that helps folks kind of see where it all sits in sits in play. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. Can never line up like that. That's perfect. Uh, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, <laughs> that's man, perfect. Man plans and God laughs. <laughs> By positioning it as an, a bigger review, also allows things to be added along that same timeline. So like if you're just saying that we're gonna look at the ADUs right now and move the ADUs to that timeline, you're restricted to public notice of just the ADUs. If you want to take a more global look at the ordinance, focusing on the ADUs, but knowing that you could be touching other parts, that is giving everybody notice in the same timeline so that if something comes up a little bit later, then there are additions and not major changes that would require longer time. Does that make sense? Why would we do that, though? Why would you do what? What you just described. I mean, we've so got this if, issue. Have we identified any other issues? That's my point. If you come up with an issue in two months, right, if we're, that's a new issue, you're not looking at it. You've got to start the, you got to start your timeline from the beginning again. If you're telling us right now that we're going to send this whole ordinance to be reviewed, knowing that the ADUs need to be touched, then anything else that gets comes up in the next month or month and a half or whatever inside of our timeline, you're able to make those tweaks and still fall into the same public hearing set for 
what did we say it was going to be June, May, so that it could so that it could be voted on in June or whatever. So so any other changes that might be identified in the next few months can all be tweaked at the same time. It's it's only covering anything that might come up versus fixing this and then having to start the process over again. I guess I. I've got enough issues on my plate right now. I, I don't see why we'd be looking for other issues if no other issues. This is an issue has been identified by our ordinance uh, department. So I don't know that any other issues have been identified. So do we want to go look for more issues or can we just? I would think you'd want to look for issues. If, if this has created such an issue that somebody cannot move forward because of our oops, right? Don't we want to know if there's other oops in there that need to be identified and not make the next person have to wait six to eight months to get it fixed? Well, structures did kind of come up. These additional structures did kind of come up late in our housing diversity conversations. So it wasn't something that I think we'd, we'd look, spend a lot of time on early or through the months and months. But I don't know. I don't understand why we'd, we would want to be looking at other issues uh, if they are identified, have them bring them forward. Um, I guess I would assume that our town council has looked at, our town attorneys kind of looked at what we passed. If there were issues. Um, have we asked? She wouldn't or, review or it without being it? asked, yeah. Well, what, what's the reason for asking for it? Do you, or do, you, do you have some identified issues? I haven't looked at it since we voted on it. No, because I don't need to. But well, I don't think we need to, but I, I don't know. I'm only one vote, so. I did, the way I looked at it is, and I support this amendment 100%. The way I looked at it is, and again, this is no judgment, nothing. It's just um, we did it very quickly, and are there any unintended consequences? And it's a quick review just to go, Psh, nope, it all worked. It won't take a long time. I don't think. Well, you know, I guess if I could interject. <laughs> since we're what? This discussion. These are not, that one of the reasons when I talked to Sturgis about sending us to workshop, you know, it, these are not technical issues. These are policy issues. And with the LD203 situation, you know, the division was, are we doing the minimum requirements required right. by law or not? So these were not like little fixes. These were intended because the law, the statute, right. did not expressly address accessory structures. So it was therefore not a minimum requirement. Now we can go ahead and change the policy like you're discussing, but that's, you know, and then the same with the uh, short-term rental. The LD 203 said a community may regulate short-term rentals, which we already have. So since we already have that regulation, that's different from the original version was to prohibit short-term rentals. So that, that it's not just a technical issue, but it's, however, it's a policy discussion and if the board wants to go uh, do a different route than LD203, that's fine. But I just think we shouldn't mislead the public into thinking these are like somehow Oops, uh, technical mistakes from a rush or something like that. These are well carefully considered legal and so LD 2003 didn't require this correct right yeah so right. it was a reference in the rulemaking and by the way there's a phrase in the rulemaking and I would just for the record ask the ordinance committee or the uh, the planner who does an excellent job at it but in the draft prepared for this uh, left out the phrase subject to accessory structure setbacks now that is required by the state guidance rules. So that was in one of the earlier versions and should be put in, I, I believe. But uh, that's kind of a technical amendment, but at any rate. That's fine. Councilor Gabrielson. Um, I'm all in favor of moving ahead with this and moving ahead on the timelines that the manager has outlined. Um, I guess one question that I have, just thinking of the relative complexity of our um, short-term rental ordinance and some of the challenges that we've had with enforcement and kind of keeping track of it. 
one of the things that I would hope to hear from back from the ordinance committee is um, just an assessment from the code enforcement officer if you know the software that we use tags places by address but I don't know if they're necessarily tagging listings by whether the structure that's being listed is an accessory dwelling unit or not so how much additional enforcement burden or or, or maybe there's none um, does it make to have to keep track of whether a listing also happens to be in an ADU or not? And I like that. I'm not. I, I don't know that the I don't know how the answer that affects my vote, but I'd like to know the answer to that um, as part of the review process. It may it may be something that's very technically fixable, but I, I that that's one one question that I have reading this proposed draft. We, we can work on that as a staff to try to find the answer for that to Councilor Gabrielson. All right. Any so further? Yes. I'm a little bit, conf I think there's something a, a little bit ambiguous or unclear. And I just want to be clear. So we're going to send this to the ordinance committee and we're going to proceed along the timeline that we discussed. We've recognized that this was not a change required by LD 2003, but it's a change that we feel would further the spirit of LD 2003 by encouraging uh, additional ADUs. Now, there was a little bit of a discussion earlier tonight about whether or not we should review all of our ordinances, and I want to know where we are on that. I mean, do we I feel think. that there's anything, do, is there anything that uh, LD 2003 required that we did not enact in December? I guess that's the question. You know, I would, um, I would ask uh, Maureen that question as part of this, and if she says no, or if she says there it could be some um, confusion here, then we can address it. But I think uh, just ask, but I understand what Tim's saying, that we implemented an LD 2003. We, we aren't saying, I'm not saying uh, move it ahead in a, another direction. I just wanna know that there's no ambiguity on the part of enforcement around it. That's all I'm. That's all I'm asking. Okay. Well, I'll. I'm happy to talk to Maureen about that and Ben. Yeah. And she. She may know. I. It was just a question. It wasn't anything beyond that. Because there is. I mean, there is some chatter out there that we're not in compliance with LD 2003. And if we're not in compliance with LD 2003, I'd like to know exactly where. Right. That's it. Got or just don't pay attention to the chatter. If, they, if somebody feels they have an issue that is, that is supportable, they should come forward in a formal process, come to us and talk to us about it. The chatter, I'm, I'm beginning to pay less and less attention to. If they have a legitimate issue, a legitimate concern that they have with what we've voted on as a council, they should come forward and talk to us about it. Come forward and talk to the town planner about it. Come forward and talk. I mean, Matt's a very intimidating guy, but I, usually he'll sit down and visit. But um, chatter is, is often a waste of time. So that's exactly what we could be doing by having the ordinance committee <laughs> look at it and say, if you see a problem with it, come let us know. But, but we're, us. we're basically admitting that we're listening to the chatter, and if we feel like we voted on as a council that the, what we put in place was right um, and complied, and we haven't had challenges, uh, you know, legitimate challenges where they'll come and speak at our podium here, I not we've got a lot of issues on our table right now. Uh, I'm not sure that this is one that we need to be spending any time on. And if somebody brings forward a real issue, that's another story. Right now, we've got a lot of stuff we're working on. I'll, 
I'll speak with Maureen and see what, see what she says. How's that? I, I agree with uh, Councilor Thompson about the merits of rehashing this, which we, I'm not. we all had a spirited discussion in the last I don't want to rehash. year no. or two. Uh, but I do want to clear for the record the, discuss the mention about the noncompliance. The lawyer in the newspaper articles and accounts of the meeting, our lawyer Mary Costinger did not say that the substitute amendment was out of compliance with LD203 or what we passed. What she said was two things. There may be a legal problem with the motion to reconsider. Or number two, whether there need to be additional public hearings for the substitute. She didn't say that the, what we passed doesn't comply with LD203. So that is directly misleading by members of the public who are saying that. And that should be ignored. And furthermore, as Council Thompson said, there has been no legal challenge. This is a town full of lawyers, and the time is passed to make the legal challenge. So at this point, uh, I agree with Councilor Thompson, why spend the time rehashing and pouring over this when there are no legal challenges and you know, no obvious problems. So, so our town lawyer is being quoted as saying just that, that we're not in compliance. Well, she's being misquoted. That's not what she said at the meeting, so. Unless, Mr. Sturgis, you have a different. Uh, uh, I would agree with you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, 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 the conflict at the time, if, if I may, was mostly about the lineup of right. <clears throat> the timing was what her concern was yeah. versus the, uh, the, the structure. So there's elements that I think that she would want to, you know, if the council wanted to have a further review, you could direct the town's attorney to review that further. And I, you know, if the town attorney is saying that to people, then we've got another problem, potentially an ethics problem. So uh, we'll, you know, we could delve into that or get more detail, but at any rate, uh, any further discussion, item two? All right, item three is the Revisiting the Ad Hoc Housing Diversity Study Committee report, continuing the discussion from <clears throat> a prior workshop. I, um, and we will begin with opportunity for public discussion. Is there anyone online who would like to make a comment? No hands raised at the moment, Mr. Chairman. All right, seeing no. <clears throat> Public comment. We can begin our discussion. Uh, you mind if I go first? Sure, Councilor Jordan. Um, I will apologize up front if this is long. Um, I just want to say first, I think the uh, work of the Housing Diversity mm -hmm. Study Committee was great. Um, and I think it offers us a lot of. Uh, uh, information and recommendations, and those are things that we as a council um, can uh, operationalize. But I think you've heard me say several times, we need, we need to establish uh, a vision or direction of where we want to take these recommendations. Um, because as we, uh, and my example is uh, Fort Williams was a fort when it was first purchased. It's now a park. And that didn't happen by happenstance. It happened as a result of uh, planning and vision and direction. So I see a part, a key part of what we as counselors do is to evaluate recommendations and establish policy that will guide the implementation. This is why Tim and I get along so well because we both believe in policy and direction. Um, so as the Housing Diversity Study Committee's work, it's a great piece of work, just as I said. And our job now is to operationalize this report and how do we do that? Um, I would propose that we have some sort of facilitated session to really set that vision. And, um, you know, a vision or a de 
directional statements such as Cape Elizabeth will encourage housing that will bring economic diversity to our community and create the opportunity for people that work in Cape Elizabeth to live in the community where they work. And we, we come to kind of a common agreement around what this goal and what this vision would be. And, and then once you have that, uh, the work that Stephanie put together will, will really start to fall into place because it'll help us prioritize that. So it'll help us to determine things like how will we be balancing or leveraging taxpayer dollars? Are we going to do a 501c3? We don't know. Um, are we going to leverage town-owned land? It could be. Um, encourage public-private uh, investment? Are we going to have TIFs? Um, these are the types of decisions that we as a council need to make and set that vision and those strategies. Um, in the near term, we might ask um, about the low-hanging fruit. But do we all agree on what we want and how we want to get there? As we make decisions on density, what will guide that? We know that it's state law, I assume, but what else? Um, yes, there are recommendations here that suggest density, but we as a council can establish strategy and determine which direction and where we want um, that density to be without being counter to state law. Um, so as I went through this, which I think is a great piece of work, now I see our role as setting that vision, that direction, because as I look at, uh, and Tim and I had this conversation today, as we look at what brought Cape Elizabeth to what it is today, it was people sitting at a table such as this, saying this is the vision we want for our town. We want it to maintain its rural character. We want it to be this. And so this housing diversity study and the outputs of that work is a long range strategy that will take years and way beyond what we, when we will be here. So it's incumbent on us to kind of take this and say directionally, where do we want to go? And that's the way, as I look at the work, I see our role. Um, because I often can't, I can, um, but that's where the kind of arguments start to happen. I can get into tactical, but tactical planning before we've established the vision and strategy only creates uh, contention and not compromise. So that's how I would like to proceed with uh, the work from the Housing Diversity Study Committee. So, <clears throat> Councilor Jordan, could you, would you please read again your opening statement? My vision? Is that a proposed vision statement? or a proposed my, goal statement? My vision directional statement? I think it was Cape the first Elizabeth. paragraph, yeah. Cape Elizabeth will encourage housing that will bring economic diversity to our community and create the opportunity for people that work in Cape Elizabeth to live in the community where they work. And we may want to, and of course, I think what I missed here, and for people to age in place, you know, those are, the types of things that as we think about this vision, then as we go now, what does it mean a strategy from a, a funding perspective? Are we going to uh, establish a 501c3? If we are, where does that take us? What does that do? Are we going to, um, uh, ask for contributions from our taxpayer, through taxpayer dollars. Um, I'm not sure. Um, 
do we want to encourage public-private investment uh, in places where we identify we want um, uh, housing? Uh, do we want, um, are there areas where I'm gonna go to the three and four and six units density, let's start taking those things that um, you always said to me, Penny, you've got policy and it's LD 2003, and we haven't set our policies yet. So that's what I'm asking is that we take, a, we take our step and understand that we are creating a blueprint for the town. And, um, and it's not a tactical plan, it's a direction. This is where we're going. We've got the data, uh, we, the people have done the work, uh, we've got the recommendations, you take that and you really create uh, uh, strategies and goals that uh, move you in that direction. It's like, um, here's one. Um, the town's vision for Fort Williams Park is to provide a safe and healthy quality space for Cape Elizabeth citizens and visitors to enjoy. Yeah, there's more. That's the vision. And so every time a strategic plan is created for Fort Williams, you go and look at this. We have policy that is um, that um, the revenues generated by the pay and display parking uh, program at Fort Williams will be employed for the following and primarily offering operational expenses and capital improvements for the fort policy. That's what our next step is from my perspective for the uh, housing diversity studies work. Thank you, Councilor Jordan. Thank you. A lot of work and so any Reactions or further thoughts? Councilor Gillis. I have a couple of questions. I, may, I don't, uh, Tim, you might be able to answer it. I, I was going through all this this weekend and were incomplete surveys thrown out? The people that didn't do the bottom half of that long survey, they, were there, they included in the results? I think we went through that quite a bit. An incomplete survey was not included in their survey results, right? So somebody went down. We had a series of questions that got down to a more complicated uh, part of the survey, and we saw that a lot of people were dropping yeah, out. I, didn't, I dropped out, and I, I was just yeah. curious. It's like, oh, yeah. my other stuff doesn't count. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so that was, that was definitely one of the problems. And then my so. other question about the survey was, there was no question about how people uh, voted on the uh, ordinance changes. So, how do you attest to the bias? Well, it's, I don't know if there's a bias, but it's called waiting. Um, the school board, uh, the, the school building advisory um, survey that most recently we did had a waiting piece in it, and the waiting piece was they specifically asked, "How did you vote on the referendum?" Right. So. If the results of the survey were significantly different than the vote, the way the vote came out, you could you could wait it. it. Turned out it was the, they had a factor that they applied to the. This had no weighting to, to, to that. So, so you have no way of knowing. Yeah, and, okay. and there was there was issues with there was there were certainly issues with the survey. No, I'm just um, it was that a, the wait the waiting thing. piece of it uh, was was one of the issues. And, and just to be clear for the public, Councillor Gillis, when you refer to the waiting the vote on the uh, ordinances, you're referencing the town center Yes, ordinance the town center referendum. ordinances. So like if people voted, it, 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 I'm just curious. The Santon Project ordinances, okay. The one, the one waiting piece they had was, as I recall, Stephanie was age. Right. So, and the way that was an interesting piece, so the way it's explained is there's so few people that were younger voted on this if a 19 or 20 year old actually completed the survey their impact on the survey was doubled. So if a 64-year-old sent the survey results in, they came in and it was, the impact was one. If a 19 or 20-year-old 
voted or sent in a survey, their impact was doubled. So there were, that was one of the biggest, that, but that was the only weighting piece that uh, was applied to uh, uh, help with the credibility of the survey. In this one. Yeah. There, there was no test for self-selection bias. Okay, that's, that, I guess that's what I was asking. <laughs> You know, we, we went through a pretty lengthy process of trying to control. We sent QR codes to all the towns, but then it ended up getting added to social media sites. There was no control where, I mean, people in Portland could have easily gone on and filled out a, so it, it, the survey was designed initially to keep control and have Cape Elizabeth people complete it, but there was no way of really controlling how that actually happened. So that was another issue with it. I have a question for Councillor Anderson. I believe, in the, as I recall, in the past, you have focused attention on a matter of, uh, that's been a great debate in Augusta, of, uh, I think it's AMI, the income levels. It's confusing to the public, you know, of 80%, 60% of median income in an area. And I know you've spent a lot of time looking at this Maybe you'd want to comment. I, I do know that we now have in our council goals reference to 80% level versus 60% level. And maybe Councilor Anderson, if you could explain this to the public, sure. that, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, if I may, first of all, I'd like to say I agree with Councilor Jordan. However, I do hope that we can identify some low-hanging fruit and get moving. Um, and yes, uh, we do have in our, in our town strategic map, uh, we have a uh, goal of ensuring diverse housing opportunities and encourage development of affordable housing opportunities for persons making 80% or less AMI. So that, that uh, travels nicely with the vision statement that Councillor Jordan had. And so I think it's making a lot of sense that way. In terms of, okay, let me, t let me talk a little bit about AMI. AMI stands for Area Median Income. And every area has its own area median income. And I looked at this today. I did not, Councillor Chair, right, we did not discuss this. I did not know that you were going to ask me this, but I did, I did look at it today. The, the AMI for our area right now is $82,810. 80% AMI is $66,248. And 60% AMI is $49,686. So what do those figures mean in terms of our workforce? And that's really what we're looking at. Um, I looked at the contracts for police, public works, and school department. Our police, after four months on the job, they make $51,579. So that means at 60% AMI, they would not qualify. They make too much money. At 80% AMI, they would qualify. And Ergo, that's why I keep talking about 80% AMI. Um, for public works, um, the lowest paid equipment operator uh, makes $47,000, so he or she would barely make the 60% AMI, but after being on the job for a short amount of time and all the other positions in public works, including lead equipment operator, mechanic, garage foreman, and parks foreman make too much money to qualify at the 60% AMI, but they would qualify at 80% AMI. Uh, teachers are in the same boat. Um, somebody on the first day on their job may squeeze in just a little bit under. At zero years, the, uh, with only a bachelor's, their salary is 48 so they're $1,000 less than the 60% cutoff. But if they take on a coaching position or anything else, it puts them over. So I say a teacher first day on the job also makes too much money. And 
All the administrative support personnel in the school department make, uh, make too much money at 60% AMI. The ed techs, about half of them would qualify and half of them would make too much money. So I think it is important if we are concerned about providing housing opportunities for people that serve our community and teach our children, I think it's important that we keep our eyes on projects as a goal at 80% area median income. And that's a strategy. And that's I, a strategy. I would like to see that as part of our strategy. Because at 60%, we exclude all those people. And if I might just add a little to this AMI conversation, that is only our employees' income. If that employee has a spouse or there's other income, that all adds on to it. So if, if, if any of our employees are actually a dual fam family income, that would also boost them very quickly above where they'd, they'd need to be to be able to qualify at the 80%. Yes. Because it's the and total they, income of the household. And if they have a, a lot of them have little part-time jobs too. But I have to say, in that vein, if they have any dependents, then that figure goes down. Or they would call, yeah. the larger the household, the lower the number needs to be. So if you have an entry level teacher who is a single person without an additional income and he or she or they have a dependent, they probably would qualify. Yeah. So it, it works both ways. And the only other thing, this was our charge that we got. It was the seniors that wanted to stay in place. Penny mentioned them as our town employees. But the third part of our charge was the young families. We, 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 we need to continue to keep the young, young families that we hope to uh, encourage to boot, move to our town. Um, we, need to, we need to address that because we do have a, a, a school enrollment that continues to go down. Uh, this coming fall, they're going to be down in the mid-1400 range. So it's definitely a challenge for a young family. What would you say our medium Household is like 7:30 now, Matt. Did, that just got bumped up, so it's we're not an easy town to afford to be able to find a place to move in. So as we're looking at housing, we need to keep them in mind as part of that. So if I could just add that to the couple that Penny mentioned, those were the three chart, the three areas that you charged us with. So, do you have any questions about AMI, anyone? Mr. Sturgis. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Anderson as well. The, uh, the, uh, the ed tech salaries actually will, will actually, there's been some legislative changes as far as compensation goes with the recent bill that uh, is going to dramatically change that compensation level for your ed tech positions. That would push them actually in the, you know, as a, as a, as a raw number individually above the, or into the 80% AMI as well. From, so from last year's numbers to where we are now, uh, going forward in 25, you're going to see that that's going to change as well. So that supports your 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 uh, hypothesis. I didn't realize that, but thank you. Yeah, the starting salary for that now is 1956 an hour, and so that's going up. It's supposed to, I think, legislatively, and don't hard quote me on this, but speaking with our HR uh, department, just because we were looking at uh, upcoming impacts of legislation that passed in the current session. I think it's going to like 27, so it's almost a 50% increase in compensation. Now the state's covering that gap, so it's not as if the school budget's getting a, a massive uh, hit, at least, you know, at least not this year. We'll, we'll obviously, you <laughs> wait and see where it comes. <laughs> the state giveth and the state taketh no. away, but that going forward, that will, uh, you know, in the next fiscal year, that will that will make a change. Well, and I also talked to some small business people and their employees make too much money too. And, and just for a reference, if you want to look at this in terms of hourly rate, 60% AMI is $23.88 an hour and 80% is $31.85 an hour. So that means that anyone that makes more than $23 an hour would not qualify to be eligible for housing that is offered at the 60% or lower AMI. 
Well, Council Anderson, that answer was so complete, thorough. <laughs> and I think, does this mean now we don't have to go through the five pages of Excel spreadsheet? <laughs> no, and, and it's actually 13 pages. Yeah. No. I, I, I didn't know if that was helpful, Mr. Chairman, to put that up there if you'd like me to, if, if you're planning on going through it. If, if you'd like to, if not, uh, just let me know what the counselors, because I could push that out to the folks at home who want to, who are watching online as well, if that discussion comes. Are, are you looking at the time? No, uh, Council Gabrielson, I think you had mentioned you might have to leave, and if you I, want to. I do, I, uh, but not for another 10 minutes or so. Could, yeah, I could let you make your comments before you leave. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I. I, I tend to agree with Penny that I, I'd like to have a little bit more discussion around what you know the directional goals are, um, but I, I'm also not opposed to to doing both at once. I, I think there are some things in here. Um, I'm looking at um, you know things like one um, B, for example, allowing duplexes to adhere to the same standards as a single family within the RC zone. That seems. Some of these things seem pretty straightforward to me. Um, and I think, so I think we could, even as we are looking at policies around, um, or, or aspirational statements around strategies or, or goals that we're hoping to achieve, I think there may be some things that we can also work toward picking off at the same time. Do you think that, because I, I thought about this, um, do you think that um, if we agree to vision, then as we go through these, we may say, uh, this is a policy statement. We need a strategy around this one. And then we develop, we develop, we'll know the ones that really need strategy to help um, drive the direction. I, I, I think so. And, and I guess to, to the discussion that we just had on AMI um, and how that impacts you know, for example, younger families who want to move into town. I, I think the real, the real goal that I hope we're chasing here, I mean, I am fully in support of making use of all of the available tools around subsidized housing where that's appropriate and making sure that everybody has access to a safe, decent, affordable place to live. But for my money, if you're looking at attracting and retraining young families, what we really need to be going for is naturally occurring affordable housing and, and so that says, you know, we need to find some ways to drive down the cost of new housing creation in town so that somebody can build a house that a young family can afford. Mm -hmm. um, so then, and, and I'd, I'd like to see that reflected in our, our vision statement, uh, may, you know, to some, I don't know how exactly, but that, that's what I hope, I, I mean, that's where I'd like to see us going. <laughs> Um, with this is not just the, the subsidize, although that, that is important, but I think, you know. I think that's a great point. That's why I think it's this whole brain trust that takes this work and says, okay, here's, here's the vision, and then, and then we uh, determine how we get there. Because 10 years from now, people are still going to be following that vision, or 20, I hope. But to get there, I truly believe I'm, I'm a, uh, a person who believes in facilitated dialogue, uh, because they're going to uh, capture all of the thoughts, the disparate thoughts, and help get them into some cohesive directional statement. Um, I really like, I, I really think the statement, Penny, that you put together almost does the, the whole thing. I mean, I think a little bit of tweaking, and I'm wondering if, given the fact that we've had an 18-month study, we, we do have, um, the results of a survey, if that can be our data, and if this group... That is the data. That is right. the data. Right. And so I think from that, we can craft this vision statement. Mm -hmm. I do, too. 
so why do we need a facilitated i i that's a suggestion i find that people who can draw out statements like jeremy just made that can get embedded in even a more a broader vision and then you set your your goals it's not a long process it's like probably one meeting but it's but i don't i don't have a problem on crafting a vision statement without somebody i just think that having somebody draw it out and i know that gp cog has worked with other communities on on doing that would would your vision be that we would the town council would craft this and then we'd have a public hearing on it i i really think it uh, uh would be um i thought about that about whether we have a public hearing on it i think we've got to test it in some way i think that otherwise we're creating a vision that is uh uh, not representative of the, the public, even though what I've grappled with is I go, okay, we heard all this input, it's right in there, so why do we need to hear it again? But basically what we will have done is taken that work and synthesized it into something that says directionally this is where we're going, just like that direction statement uh, vision for Fort Williams. And that's, that's lived a long life. So we want something that's enduring. So we don't want the community to go, well, you didn't ask us if that's really what we wanted. So I think we should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't want it to take a long time because of just like you say, you spent 18 months on something, but then we've got to look at the recommendations because as I read the recommendations, each one of them, I said, ah, strategy strategy and i went to the next one strategy um if you paid me uh, 150 dollars an hour i could write the whole thing just based on what i've seen oh no i can't take that that's not in our code of ethics but i mean it's all right there it really is wow I hope we can talk about a little low-hanging fruit. I don't. I don't have. I, I don't have a problem with talking to low-hanging fruit as long as I know what is the uh, criteria we're using for the low-hanging fruit. Are we looking at things that have the least amount of impact on um, uh, neighborhoods and uh, people's homes and? Yada, yada, yada. Are we looking at things that have no cost to the town? Um, is it uh, minimal ordinance change? What's the criteria we're using in order to determine low-hanging fruit? You probably have what's high impact, medium impact, low impact. So then if you take that as the measures, then what is low impact and what's high impact? That's when I think about going through things like this, we have to have some level of agreement as to what we're looking for. And you can develop that by Jeremy saying, I pick this one as a low hanging fruit because I, I don't see um, a, a big impact at this point in time because it's blah. So then you go, okay, that's what low impact means. But we've gotta have something that guides us through it. That's just my opinion. Mr. I may have a different opinion than you. Mr. Chairman? Oh, I'm sorry. So one of the things that would make sense to me, because clearly this was a challenging, this is one of the most challenging committees that I've ever been on in the town. Identifying, identifying what, what we could actually come back to the town with recommendations of that was doable. <clears throat> I would have changed, seriously, Going back just a little bit, I would have changed your pro the process quite a bit. Um, I would have waited to do the study first until the committee was put together. 
I would have allowed the committee to actually put the study together and find out what they thought needed to be. So the $45,000 on that study, we hardly looked at it. Um, I'm not sure how much the town council's really looked at it, but I would have done that. I, I, would, I would recommend to the town council, if you can't find staff to support a committee, and we got a new committee coming up, we just voted on the other night. If you can't find staff to, within our staff or that lives in town, I'd recommend you, you probably rethink that one because the staff situation was very difficult. Um, but all that, all having said all that, the biggest challenge that we had um, was where do we do this? You know, where, where's the land? Where can, where can we, we want to do affordable housing. We all agreed we want to do affordable housing. Where do we do it? And, uh, you know, we, we've got some options that we, we're going to be able to look at down the road. I think, I think Gullcrest, one side or the other, may offer, offer us some, and I'm looking forward to the study that we're working on. But it's the only real town-owned property that offered us a large opportunity without changes to the ordinances. Apparently, the ordinances that we have in place could apply to, to Gullcrest. But if we're serious about it, that means we would be willing to we would be willing to come together. And I'm not supposed to use the word compromise anymore to draw us together in consensus. Uh, but you know, there there's some solutions out there. But the finding of the land in this town, uh, part of the great planning that we've done for decades and decades, and Deb's been here for a lot of it. <laughs> we. When Penny and I got together, this is a really well-run, really well-organized town with great ordinances. Selt's done a nice job with us. Um, I, I look at these all as great ordinances. I, I bristle a little bit when I now hear them being referred to as barriers. But if we could get together and draw some consensus and find solutions that don't need ordinance changes, um, that'd be a great first step. And, that, and I guess that would be one definition of low-hanging low fruit. What can we do within town-owned property now that would not require any ordinance changes? Uh, that'd be a nice, easy first step to consider. That was well said. Thank you. Council Anderson. I, yeah, I have... When I think of low-hanging fruit, I guess I think of things that won't be too much trouble and won't be controversial. Um, I, I think, I, I, I'm thinking of two categories of low-hanging fruit. One is the ADUs. Mm -hmm. And I think we've made a lot of progress and there's, a, there's just a couple more things that were recommended in this report that I was hoping we could look at tonight that would sort of you know, put the lid on, you know, where we need to be with ADUs. And the other thing is back to Councillor Gabrielson's comments about what can we do to encourage the building of smaller homes. I mean, if you're talking more affordable, you're basically talking smaller. And I, I would look at the category of, of, what, of, of what is known as non-conforming lots. Mm -hmm. We have most of the neighborhoods in town are lots that are non-conforming. And in those neighborhoods, there are some empty lots, which you can't build on because... Um, and so one of the recommendations is to reduce uh, the lot size um, and get as many of those non-conforming lots into a conforming status as possible. Mm -hmm. And that is in... Um, think that's non-controversial? <laughs> I love how naive you are. Well, I, I... But I agree with you. I think that's a great one. I, I agree. We talked a lot about that, trust me. I mean, it, that, that... I agree. It's maybe a, 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 goal, a great goal, but it's not going to be without controversy. But it's still one, I think, worthy of... Right. We, might, we might find that... By doing something like that, it, you, we could at least find some that w would not get the great pushback. But that's something, it's, you go back to the to 2019 comprehensive plan, that was one of the recommendations I think we looked at 
exactly. way back then. So. Um, and so now we're taking all of that and we're setting the direction. Because I, I agree with you, Stephanie, that it's when we talked about it in the comp plan, that's like one of those obvious things. Why, why can't we do that? Uh, um, but what I think about is that uh, that is aligning with directional statements. And, uh, and I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily consider it low-hanging fruit. It's probably a, a medium from my perspective because as we go through doing that, uh, it's going to create controversy. But I think it's something we should do, but we need to let people know here are the, here are the things that we see as bringing more housing and diverse housing to Cape Elizabeth. I do think that Part of that is density, and we've talked about that before, because there's, no, there's not a lot of land opportunity. So you're gonna get it through density. Um, and I will just say that uh, we have not necessarily voted on whether or put forward as a strategy whether town-owned land will be used for housing development. I'm not opposed to it, but we haven't all agreed on it. I'd like to ask Mr. Sturgis, if memory serves me right, there were 70 or 80 infill lots? 72. 72. Exactly. But they're not all buildable. So is that what you're referencing, specifically the infill lots? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Some of them would, if, if they were serviced by sewer, I think it opened up the opportunity for um, some lots could be, so if there's maybe, so I don't know what the plan for sewer expansion in town is, but that certainly helps when you're talking about a small lot. Well, most of these lots are already on sewer. Yeah. And th that's sort of the beauty of it because it, it wouldn't really take town infrastructure and if you've got a smaller lot, you're gonna build a smaller house. That helps. So that's why I like this, and that's why I consider it low-hanging fruit, but I, I think there is gonna be, yeah, there are gonna be abutters that are gonna come in and say, my kids used to play there and whatever. I mean, there, exactly. there will be people that, exactly. that right. object to it. Exactly. Um, yeah. But the only way we can get any of this moving is to tee one up and see how it flies. I want to go to Tim's comment, even though I, I know they're sewered, but another, as you build this direction for uh, housing diversity, one of the, a strategy would be sewer expansion in order that, blah, 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 blah. Uh, those, are the, those are the things that we all need to agree to and that our community needs to know that uh, we have in the plan so that when you start spending money on something, they know, oh, it's taking us in this direction. Uh, so, but uh, the ADU thing is, I agree that we should do it. There's only two more things here mm -hmm. that would finish off the whole ADU section. And so then that gets crafted as ADU and it has to go through the whole process of public comments or any ordinances that need to be addressed, which I think you already did. Um, well, will, will it, does it take town funds? If so, what is it? Um, well, the only two left under this would be that the town should consider proportional changes to setbacks and lot coverage to allow detached ADU development. Okay, ordinance change. Okay. That's an ordinance change. And, you know, I mean, if we agree, I mean, we, that could be teed up right away. And then the, the last item here, because we've already done most of them, is uh, number six, the town should develop a system to track the number of ADUs to determine policy changes that may need to evolve. Mm -hmm. So 
So if we said that the low hanging fruit that we will work on is around ADUs, and then we're also doing directional high level at the same time, that could tee up an ordinance change and we could see how it flies. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you have any kind of an update on where, what's on the, through your main municipal association convention and work, what where, uh, is being worked on in Augusta now that could be uh, coming down the road, uh, you know, furthering the work of like the LD 2003? Is, is there anything that we should be looking at uh, if, as part of our planning? I reached out today to uh, get the status that the, the one bill that's been most upsetting to the Maine Municipal Association has been the idea or notion of building a statewide building permit review board. Oh my God. I thought that got killed. So that has stalled. It got, it, didn't it get defeated in committee? However, <laughs> uh, hang on. <laughs> no, we want to know the answer. That's been the big one. However, the answer I got was, you know, the session is continuing until mid, uh, late April. The clock is ticking. There's more time. And so you all may be aware of a, uh, some local town votes of late, one in Cumberland, which got some attention, in which a uh, affordable housing development that was supported by the town manager and the chair of their board and all that was soundly defeated, 69% to mm -hmm. whatever, you know, I don't know if they're on the side and all. That got some attention from the housing advocacy community around the state, and so they promised to go back to Augusta. So the Maine Municipal Association reported to me today, they're hearing noise of potential additional legislation or efforts. Whether or not there's enough time, I don't know. So the quick answer is, uh, so as of now, no, there are no immediate piece of legislation we would need to consider impact, but there might be. Well, what, what are they considering around that? Around they didn't give me details. Wow. I'll find out and let you know. That would be really good, because that's, so. I mean, LD 2003 happened, and somehow it should have gotten stopped, but it didn't. So we don't need another one. Yeah. Two, there were two bills we'll that were up. argue for two years. <laughs> there, there were two bills up there that both got killed in, finally in committee. One was the one for a state. If you didn't, you could bypass your, your town um, licensing procedures and go right to a state one, which did get killed. And the other one was that a town couldn't set a minimum lot size of less than or more than 5,000 square feet. And that also failed in committee. But Cumberland is there, yeah, we don't, we don't know what's gonna, I mean, I think a big reason, or a part of the reason why Cumberland failed is the AMI issue. It would not allow its employees to live there. Exactly. And people understood that. Uh, uh, Councilor Anderson, to your question as well, and to Councilor Thompson's question, um, <clears throat> we're the managers uh, Southern Maine managers, like we meet once a month uh, online and had a conversation after the vote uh, from last week. Uh, part of the conversation was the thought that in the next session, because the next session is the, f the first session, so you know, basically the rails drop and everything gets a little bit more loose, uh, loosely affiliated. However, the, the discussion was that we anticipate that there'll be a permit by rule approach for housing, for, for multifamily housing that so they'll take that away from, you know, similar to what we've done with regulations of wetlands and things along those lines where they, uh, that's been taken over as part of the uh, authority of the state that they may end up growing that into, like the housing question for large multifamily will go more to the statewide side with a permit by rule approach and take it right away from the towns and uh, because of the you know, experiences that we've all, that we've all had and there's, I think there's three or four more in the near near future that are also lined up for votes probably in June. So uh, I anticipate that that, li that 
the bill may be dormant at this time in the legislature, but that I have a feeling that that will be coming coming back to our. But that would not be until next January, right? I think that'll be for next. Uh, we anticipate that that'll be in the next next le legislative session if this one doesn't get uh, CPR and and comes back onto the table by some. Are you session. kidding? I wish I was, but that's th those are serious. I have to tell you, and I I know this is being recorded, and I hope that they hear me. That labor and housing committee is out of control in Augusta. The people who sit on that. I, and you know how liberal I am. They're beyond me. And I deal with them all the time during the session from a labor perspective, um, and they have no clue. And so, can I be on MMA the next? <laughs> no, but I mean, I do think when you look at something like that, what that's coming down the road based on what a lot of the town managers in Southern Maine think that further erosion of home rule. I think the other bill that I heard that's being talked about up there is, is what Massachusetts has done is basically dictating to a town, this is your goal for, these are the, this is your number, you gotta live to this. And, and so when, when, when we're talking about a goal for affordable housing uh, starts over the next 10 years and the number of ADUs we wanna have, I think if that's really something as Matt's saying, is gonna be continually taken away from us and we're gonna have that dictated. I'm a little more reluctant to establish a goal. Now, if it's not gonna happen for a while, maybe I would be able to have some kind of a non-binding, let's have a pie in the sky kind of a goal, but I'd hate the town to, to put a goal on us and then have a goal dictated to us. Because I think if they, if they make it mandatory, um, there's another word for it, but basically they dictate what we have to do. I think funding comes with that. If, they, if we get a mandatory required goal, then I think we get some funding from the state. But if we've already established a goal that is at or above that, then we probably don't get some funding to help us with our affordable housing goal. So I'm a little less reluctant to, to say as a, as a council, a very, very firm goal on uh, what we'd like to see. Because if that gets erod eroded and taken away from us from a control standpoint, then, then uh, and it could have some negative financial effect on the town. Don't you think if, um, if there was, uh, if it was demonstrated that uh, towns were setting goals, that, uh, that that is a more positive thing, that we're already doing this. Then when, then when you go to Augusta to testify, it's like, we're already doing this. Here it is. You don't need to do it for us. Um, because that's what has to start being demonstrated. That's why LD 2003, they, you talk about the ordinance barriers, yada, yada, yada. Um, they saw that towns were, or felt that towns weren't doing anything. I think towns have to demonstrate that they are doing it. Yeah. That's and, my opinion. And, and I guess to, to the other thing I'd say is, if we're talking about a goal in our town to hit our three targets, the older people that want to downsize, the young families that want to move in here, and our town employees, and we're, we're targeting the group that would qualify at the 80% AMI, then I, I think those are goals I'd fe feel comfortable um, talking about. I think the targets that are going to be coming from Augusta are probably going to be broader than that. They're going to be talking about the 60% and the 30%, and we're going to, that's going to be a dictate that we're going to have to accomplish as well. So. You're going to say, uh, a hundred housing units or something, and they're gonna start talking housing units. That's my, that's what I think. And then it's going to force density and that's not what we want to Well, and, and, and they're already talking about in neighborhoods that have been already designated as high growth areas, then that's when you're gonna dictate it. So one of the recommendations in the study is to expand our high growth neighborhoods. It'd be another reason I'd be opposed to doing that because that exposes those neighborhoods that aren't yet identified as high growth to that density requirement. So that goes to, if we are going to create our vision and direction for implementation of the Housing Diversity Study Committee's report, we need to pull those things out, that this is the direction we want to go. Um, so that we, we're setting it so everybody sees it. 
you know, one of the LD 2003 contains a directive that the Department of uh, Economic and Community Development was set statewide and regional housing production goals. I've called up there a few times, and they, last time I spoke uh, with somebody up there, they really hadn't made any progress. But there is the housing summit. Is anyone else here registered for that? No, I got a day job. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I wish I could go. Well, I'm going, and I'm registered, and I, you know, might be able to, there, there might be more information along those lines there. I know GP Cog says that we have to do our area 20, was it 22 or 24,000? 1,000 new homes in the next five years. <laughs> it was either 22 or do you remember, Tim, what I it think was? It was? I think it was 22,000. In the greater, so that would be the greater, I think it's basically GP Cog covers all of Cumberland County and maybe a couple additional towns, but it's basically the greater Portland area. They've identified the need for 22,000. Well, remember, Bridgeton's in Cumberland County also. Yeah. Okay. It goes way out there. So the challenge, I mean, the bottom line is affordable housing is going to be something that we need to, to, go, to, to get together on, work together on, build some, there's gonna be a lot of consensus building and compromise that needs to be, I, I mean, we had people that came to us and wanted to do it at Fort Williams. They, you know, Lions Field. I mean, we had to get, so those are things that you gotta, and we kind of push back on all of that, but there are going to be some tough choices for us. Um, and, and it may be that, that uh, you know, we, and, and unfortunately, there's going to be a, probably a lot, of mo a lot more opportunity for public input on this. Um, but it's not going to be an easy problem for the town to solve. It is if we set the direction. I mean, it's not going to be easy, easy, but um, I, I just believe in frameworks. And I think if we have a framework, people will understand where we're going. Yeah, and we, it, it's doable. It, I'm not, I'm, I shouldn't say that it's, I don't want to give the impression we can't do it. We could definitely build affordable housing in Cape Elizabeth, definitely do that. So what's our direction? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I may, uh, uh, Councilor Jordan, I think you, you really set a great tone to get things started. And oftentimes the way the council has worked historically, and you know this as well as I do, you set your vision and your goals, or you set your vision, and then from there your policy flows. So I think you've done a great effort to get things started this evening. And I know it sounds funny, but uh, but this is a marathon. You know, this isn't something that is really that you bang out in one night. So I think it's, you know, you establish that, then you establish your policies that flow from that, and then the council, and then you can, you know, you have your goals that also are attached from that policy. You know, it's almost like the laddering effect. And then from there you get your uh, you get your deliverables that come from there, and hopefully you know they could be ordinance changes, it could be you know affordable housing tips, it could be all the different tools that might be available that uh, that the council could put to its discretion. So as this evolves and that conversation uh, grows, that I think you'll you'll get there because uh, and then and and to Councillor Anderson's thoughts as well, the low hanging fruit. If it's there, you can you can pick that off, and then you can say, well, this is consistent with the goal, the vision that we've set and the policies that we've established, and then it can flow from that pretty quickly, I think. So, are you saying, because um, I'm a person who likes to just like I see the Fort Williams policies written um, and vision that I see, it could be one page or two pages, but I think we need to do it. And, and everything flows from that. And it's not gonna be perfect. It's gonna be the start and we're gonna have to tweak it. Um, I, I know that uh, GP Cog has done this with other communities. I just want to know if that's the direction we wanna take or do we wanna craft it our, ourselves, which will take, I think, more time. I think with somebody getting us through all this discussion we've had right now would have been captured, um, consolidated, we'd look at it and we'd go, okay, that's, that looks good. 
we just have the conversation again. That's my proposal. Well, uh, Councillor Anderson. I think we've already done it. Yeah. Is it? And I think I think we've done it. And you know, there's a couple of phrases we want to add in. And I think maybe the next step is letting the public know and letting them comment. But I think there's more to it than one statement. Because as you look at the recommendations within there, there are things that say, do we want this strategy or do we want this strategy? Well, it's, you it's, gave the like financial tools as an example. Do we, do we want a 501c3 or some kind? And I think we, I don't think we can, I don't think we can answer that question right now. I think. So then the, uh, the strategy becomes we, uh, we will uh, evaluate on uh, funding. Uh, well, I don't know why we couldn't do it now. Because we don't know. <laughs> because we, we, we don't know. We don't know if we can get people interested in doing it. I mean, be, there, there are several. There were several potential. So strategies. if you say that um, <clears throat> we want to evaluate the uh, opportunities or the whatever around 501c3s, um, then you know that that's something that, that you do want to do. Do you want taxpayer dollars allocated to affordable housing? Then, well, if the answer is yes, you say, uh, we will uh, uh, tax dollars will at this level would be allocated, or tax dollars would be allocated to affordable housing projects. Do we want town-owned land for affordable housing projects? I think that depends on the project, doesn't it? Wouldn't we have to see the project first? No, before we say we're what gonna. If you, what if you don't want a project on? What if you don't even want a project on town-owned land? So you either have to say we will um, uh, we will assess projects that would be on town-owned land, or we would say we will not leverage town-owned land for affordable or housing. Those are the things that we need to decide on. That's what's sitting in that document. There's a lot of decisions that are directional statements. Uh, Councillor Gillis. I forgot. I'm going to interject. <laughs> oh, it hasn't been that long? <laughs> Come on. Yes, I was right on the ball. Waving her hand over her <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm just. I create frameworks. I don't. I don't look and then decide. I go. Can we create a framework that help us with our decision making? Well, I know. Yes. I don't think we should get into in our framework on uh, uh, things like uh, public land, housing on public land, and things like that in the statement. I, I, I don't think that was a. a uh, I, I think your first statement is spot on, you know, for the first step. You can't do anything till somebody comes forward and says, I want to build on Gullcrest, or I want to build behind the town hall, or I want to build here. We don't yeah. own, we don't own that. Oh, you mean over here, the parking lot? Yeah, I, I okay. forget where I am. Because we don't own that. Yeah, no, I forget uh, where I am. It's, it's up to you guys. I just know that we're going to have a lot of conversation about each one, and out of that might come a strategy. True. But I could go through this recommendation and create a whole bunch of them, but I got a day job. I got a, house, I got a school building advisory committee that I got Three meetings tomorrow. <laughs> Three meetings tomorrow. Matt, can you give us any kind of an update on where we're at on the methane study at the at, at the? Uh... Sure, 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 okay. uh, Councillor Councillor Thompson. I'd, I'd love to, Mr. Chairman, if you may. Uh, thank you. Um, spoke immediately the next day with uh, Steve Harding, 
and met with the with also uh, I think two days later with the with the firm uh, to do the work for us, Arcadis, and uh, we've said you know council approved this with funding in place to do that work, and uh, we'd like to get it done. So we're apparently we're having an early spring. So I anticipate that we would be able to get there sooner than we had first anticipated. So okay. uh, we've got that work, uh, you know, uh, I guess you could say authorized to go forward. So, so as soon as we can get that going, we will. Uh, also have them uh, take a look at if there's a, uh, and just, be, just because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a current item that sits out there, it's PFAS, uh, just in case. So uh, just said, well, while you're there, uh, if, if PFAS is an issue or not, please let me know uh, so we can find out about that. Some of it because it's uh, water and sewer, uh, not an issue as much as, you know, if someone was putting a well uh, at the property. So that's that's one area that he immediately identified or the, the consultant we spoke to identified. So, but they are gonna have some uh, response relating to that. And then while they're there, we're having them take a look at the community garden as well and the soil there just to test that, just to, Good. See, no. to see where we're at. So we'll try to, try to wrap it all together, but uh, that's, that's where we're at. And we'll, as soon as we get the report back, we'll give it to council. We'll get that back and deliver it at a council meeting. Thank you very much, appreciate Welcome. it. Thank you. Councilor Gillis. Did we ever do a methone, uh, methane test when we put the fields in? No, do you mean the athletic fields up top? Yeah. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't close I enough. Guess, I guess you could say a. It, it, the thought was it wasn't close enough, but b. I don't believe it was a consideration. It wasn't a consideration. Okay. Would, be, would, would probably be the more uh, closer to. I was just curious. You know, I, th I think that. I think it's pretty equidistant, isn't it? Yeah. No, uh, as far as the the athletic fields, uh, I mean you've got. Uh, recycling center between there, uh, paved roads. Uh, it's a pretty good. It's a pretty good distance uh, from one to the other. So as far as uh, you know, the exposure or traveling, it, the closer you are, obviously, the, the greater the impact. So I think it's a considerable distance from there in relationship to um, the flows of it. And then the topo is also is also different uh, from that. The what is uh, topography? Uh, change the elevation from the upper fields to where the uh, where the recycle the, or where the recycling facility and the cap landfill is are probably maybe 20 or 30 feet of elevation would be my uh, uh, uneducated guess, but. You know, uh, from a historic perspective, how exciting to potentially have an affordable housing development in lands that were part of the Jordan families. They want a fitting, as I understand it, the, the, the Gullcrest properties were generously donated by a, some member branch the of the Jordan of the family. The other side. Yeah, the opposite. We, the other we side. overlooked the Sproink River. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> we, we actually purchased oh. Yeah. Oh. Right. from, was it, was it a Jordan family? Or, I know it was part of our report, I can't remember who, but we actually purchased that. That was land. purchased through a straw. straw Again. Deb was here and, and, and probably, it was like, it was a relatively small, in today's number, all that, all that land that we were able to buy was quite a, quite a steal, in, certainly in today's terms. But. Those, those Jordans create a lot of open space. <laughs> <laughs> and we're very happy that you have. <laughs> Just one last point uh, for the benefit of the public. <laughs> Councilor Thompson referenced issues of uh, mandates, state mandates, unfunded mandates. There is a, a section that's in the Constitution of the state. Fortunately, from the perspective of home rule, enthusiasts and advocates. And so this is a hurdle for the state and it gives them fits they need to get a two-thirds vote to avoid this uh, mandate of 90% uh, annual funding to the municipalities for these mandates. So to give an example, they didn't come close with LD2003 uh, in the passage in the, it has to be both House and Senate at two-thirds approval. So I, I think it's probably doubtful they would get that for any of these 
items that are being mentioned. So this would be heading towards some major court litigation at some point. Hopefully that will be avoided. But uh, so from the perspective of home rule enthusiasts, there's a lot of hope. Okay, Hank, you ready? Because I am a home rule enthusiast, I guess. <laughs> Local rule. I know Deb's an enthusiast. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All, right. All right, well, I think we're at the end, unless there are any other comments. Well, what are we doing? Do, does, do I, I know we can't vote, but is there consensus that we at least do, um, what I suggested for the ADUs, yeah. which would be the town should consider proportional changes to setbacks lot coverage to allow detached ADU development in areas where an ADU would otherwise be unavailable to a property owner. That's number five. So that's got to be, to move forward on that, that would now go to the ordinance committee. Council. To send it to the, the council ordinance. first to refer send it, it to. to the ordinance. Okay. Committee. Right. And the town should develop a system to track the number of ADUs. I don't think that's an ordinance committee issue, but that could go to the town council for a vote. Or the developer. Hmm? Okay. What? We have to yeah, develop something. On, on that, Councilor Anderson, if, if I may, Mr. Chair. Yes, on number six, uh, that would that'd be something that you would want to, uh, you know, if you had number five, you would uh, refer that to the ordinance committee, would be the action. And then uh, could have on that same item uh, an additional motion to, to direct staff to develop, a, you know, a develop tracking mechanism, a tracking mechanism in, con in in line with the desires of number six, and that could and that gives us direction and puts us on our way, and we can get to that. And one nice thing I think we could do to continue to keep this top of mind for us is maybe get some kind of a report. I mean. There seems to be, there was like a built up demand to get some ADUs. I was certainly getting a lot of pressure to, to, to get that done. Have we had a number of ADU permits? Uh, but maybe we could get a re, some kind of a report on a, on a monthly basis for a while to see how, how much, uh, how many ADUs are being applied for and built. I'd really like to keep an eye on that and, and because it's a, a signal and a sign that some some affordable units are being built. Maybe quarterly. Or quarterly. Uh, yeah, I quarterly would be fine. Little... I'd be fine, but I think it would be one way to keep kind of this in front of us. I, I know that there's been questions um, about the um, separate structures being turned into ADUs, which at this moment is not permissible. And that's why I'd like to get that ordinance changed as quickly as possible so that people can get that done this summer. Yeah. But that, that was something that came up late in our conversations and I think it's something everybody was pretty much in agreement with. But right. uh, if, that's, if that's something that we could, and, and we've got that, that's the one that lines up perfectly with all our meetings, right? Okay. <clears throat> Just a quick question, as far as Councilor Jordan's vision statement, would you like to have that for council action as well on the April agenda? Are you giving me, are you delegating? No, I'm just, just inclining. You've, you've already got the work complete. <laughs> First draft, only draft, but it's, a, but I'll I know if that's something that you'd like to. I got to tweak it because it was just quick. It only took me like five minutes. So I'll, I'll add a few other things. Is that, is that an item that you'd like to have that for the April agenda to be there? What? I'll type and you it. wanted to add to it, right? I'm going to add to it. I want to tweak it. It's just it it needs a little more panache. But if, if if you'd like, we could you know that that's an item that we could have there. I mean, obviously you could you could look at it there and say yes, we like it, or you could uh, you know you could not take no action, just say you know bring it back a month really later sucks, after the signing. So I'm just going to say yeah. that too. Hey, you, I would getting into my that. martini time here. Come on. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> but if you could, we, I just want, I'm just trying to keep our, our dance card lined up for. <laughs> I'll get it to you. Now, I do have a last question. So, is there a consensus to prohibit 
short-term rentals of ADUs. Exactly. That is the consensus. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And, and that's, a, that's an interesting one. I think it is a, con that was one of the tools that they were wanted to use to encourage people to do the ADUs so they could afford to do it. But it's clearly something that's not in line with what we already have in place to limit or make some strong limits to short-term rentals in town. It took so. us 18 months <laughs> to do that short-term yeah. rental ordinance. Yeah. Councilor Gillis. Penny. The, in the, when you were doing the short-term rental before, it, was, it involved housing most of the time, correct? It was housing that was being used for short-term rental. It was houses, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and side apartments or anything yeah. that they could rent they, but the But the problems that arose and caused all this were houses that were being rented. Oh. Yeah, like full houses for weekend parties. parties and, and, and that's where why, why that whole thing came about. I'm wondering, some of these ADUs may be for elderly people that could have an opportunity to make a little money in the summertime if they rent it out. There, I mean, I don't want to start a whole new ADU you issue. You don't want to start a whole new short-term rental thing. They can rent it for uh, yeah. a we month, two months. 30, 30, 30 days. days. Oh, you, they can do that. Okay. They That's can do. All, yeah. They can okay. do that. Can. And and there's no limit to if they wanted to have their mother-in-law move in okay. in the long term. No, I know that. Yeah, it was yeah more but like I think that's the way our our short-term rental is now. It's got it. We they can do it now if they've got over 30 days, right? Oh, it has to be over 30 days. Okay. They can do a rental over 30 days. It's not considered a short-term rental. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's not like you can't, you can't vacation and cape in someone's... I don't want you rent. guys to be spending all your ordinance time on short-term rentals. Okay, well, so then we just go with the ordinance the way it was drafted then, with the exception of a language uh, amendment that... Tim had some... That you had, you had one out. piece that you needed to change, didn't you, that yeah, there was you mentioned? A phrase to be reinserted. Subject to setbacks, I can give you the phrase. Okay. Uh, Are you okay with it not being short-term rental? Yeah. The, the only other kind of stylistic question, or see what, what Maureen thinks, is to would it make sense to put the ADU ex ex exception in the short-term rental ordinance itself versus off separately in another section? But you know, that's just a strategy that. Yeah, that you all can decide that in the ordinance committee. That's right. That's right. I mean, in other words, wouldn't it make sense? I, I think there would be a logic to dealing with the ADU carve out in the short term rental ordinance itself. But what do you, what do you mean by carve out? Well, if you're saying that I see ADUs would not uh, qualify for short-term Oh, rental. yeah, so it should be in that. both places. The, the amendment needs to be in the ADU section and then also in the short-term short rental section. It, just, it seems to me people, if they're looking at, does this qualify as a short-term rental, they're going to look at that section first. And so, but, you know, but maybe, yeah. Oh. It's not a big issue but for us. Yeah, this I know is, it's been, uh, uh, you've even confused me, Phil. I'm going to have to look into that. I don't okay. see, yeah, I don't see where there's an exception, but... Oh, you don't? No, because we're saying that you can't do it, just like you can't do it anywhere. Okay. Do you get what I mean? Like, you can't do a short-term rental now, so you can't do a short-term rental in an ADU, so I'm not seeing where there's an exception. Well, in other words, I, I think the proposal is to put in an express paragraph saying it's prohibited. With an Correct. ADU. I'm just saying the choice could be to... Uh, address it within the short-term rental ordinance. Put it in both spots. It's the same meaning, and it's just right. it's a strategy. We'll let you know, that board yeah, we'll look at it and figure it out. Yeah. Do we have public comment? I think that's the opportunity at the beginning. So, oh, we have, we did decide what to do with the vision statement, okay. And he's gonna work right. out. Yeah, Matt yeah. delegated. No hands up, <laughs> I think we're done. Exactly. Thank you very much. No public comment? 
Sure. Well, the opportunity was at the beginning of the year. And there were no hands raised. Were there? No. No. 